Hello and welcome to the audio experience of the Clarity Podcast. Every second of this podcast is full of clarity. If you miss it, you lose. Today, my guest is Dr. Chintan Vaishnav. Uh, Dr. Chintan Vaishnav is the mission director at the Atal Innovation Mission, a fascinating initiative by Niti Ayo, the government of India. Dr. Vaishnav is also the academic director at the Tata Center for Technology and Design at MIT. He's a visiting professor at IIT Bombay and Sundarajan, a chair visiting professor at IASC Bengaluru as well. Dr. Vaishnav, our mission today is one, spread clarity. Well, thank you very much, Paritosh. It's uh, wonderful to be here and I will do my best. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, for the audience now, by the way, everyone who's listening into this podcast right now, make notes of the various moments of Dr. Vaishnav's life and note what choices he made, why he took certain actions, because that is what will bring the change in your life. All right. So Dr. Vaishnav, the first 10 minutes of this podcast are fundamentally going to be about just one simple thing, and that is what have been the top, the most defining moments of clarity in your life? Take the stage, sir. Okay, well, that's a, uh, what, at one level, a tough question. At one level, quite a simple question. For me, uh, I have to say a lot of that began after I went uh, to engineering school. Until then, it was very driven by uh, decisions others made for me for example I went to electronics engineering as a discipline because people said oh it's a great thing to be an electronic engineer and so on so that's how I ended up there once I was alone uh, uh, during my bachelor's and I, I started to take longer walks and be with myself um, then a few things were clearer for example in the final year of engineering uh, I had an internship uh, at uh, ISRO and uh, ISRO uh, in Bangalore was very generous. Um, they put together a talk series by scientists to talk about uh, what are the emerging areas, uh, what does the nation need, what should one choose, uh, what are the options and so on. And they, they laid out to us that uh, there were two major thrusts uh, where nation needed people. One was uh, uh, semiconductors and another one was communications and networking. Now both were exciting. But uh, to me, I was uh, uh, drawn to, I, I was keen to do networks and communications because somehow it felt to me like it will take me closer to people and being closer to people was uh, important because if one's uh, 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 life's work doesn't contribute to improving other lives, then um, one would have wasted a lot of time. So with that simple hypothesis, I went into the direction of networks after my bachelor's, uh, did my master's in electrical and computer engineering in the United States at Colorado State University. There I was also uh, studying networks. That uh, education took me to AT&T Bell Laboratories uh, doing research. Uh, AT&T uh, was a top research place at that time. There was a lot to learn from people, uh, very exciting technical work. But I think my second uh, important moment came, again, it was all thanks to long walks, um, that uh, uh, where it began to uh, occur to me that uh, while we were uh, producing a lot of technology, we were really going crazy quarter to quarter, producing tremendous amount of technology. But it didn't feel to me like we were solving some of our most fundamental challenges like hunger, poverty, etc. It bothered me that we had been at this idea of producing technology since at least since industrial revolution, so 150 years. And how come all these problems are not getting solved? So that frustration uh, led me to uh, sort of learn a whole bunch of things. But I, I, I realized that as an engineer, I was taught tools to make something. I could make a cell phone, I could make a switch, network switch. Um, but I had no idea what happens once I make it. Once it begins to, once that artifact begins to um, um, interface with the world, the society, how does it change the society? I had no theories about it. Uh, and so I decided to learn along those lines. And that's what take me to engineering systems uh, at MIT uh, to get a PhD. And this course admitted engineers and scientists, but it oriented them uh, to social sciences. 
problems of law, problems of public policy, problems of anthropology, sociology, etc. So I, 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 I started to learn those, uh, those things. Now, what is ironic is that after one graduates from a top institution, people who are willing to hire you or pay you big bucks are not the ones who are wanting you to work on problems of inequities. You know, these are people who want you to work on other types of problems. And I, I was quite frustrated with that situation. So I, I ended up, uh, again, long walks, uh, <laughs> writing about it, and ended up writing a piece that, that tried to articulate how problems of gross inequities can actually be formulated as problems of socio-technical systems where there is a technological complexity but there is also the human complexity. And that work uh, then led me to uh, uh, at one point meet Mr. Tata who was trying to create a center called the Tata Center for Technology and Design at MIT which was about teaching engineers and managers how to think about problems of uh, underserved communities. That is what led me to join that center and be its academic director, create curriculum so we could teach students how to think about these problems. In the process, for five, over those five, six years, I spent some 17 to 18 months living and working in rural to very rural India, uh, northern Karnataka, Maharashtra, uh, uh, Uttarakhand, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh, understanding challenges of people. And that's what lent me this current uh, opportunity where, again, there was a little bit of a moment of truth there when, when this opportunity to uh, come as the mission director for Atal Innovation Mission came about, uh, where one had to decide that does one want to interrupt their uh, ongoing uh, career and move to India for a couple of years or whatever that appointment may be. Uh, and I realized that, you know, I have been teaching this kind of uh, uh, technology policy type of work over these years. If I weren't willing to move and do something about it, then I shouldn't be teaching it. So that's how I, I ended up uh, uh, moving. On that note, tell me something, uh, Dr. Vaishnav. You know, when you were in college, did you really have that clarity as to what is it that you want to do in life? Um, but not really. I have to, I don't know how to describe it. I, there is often more clarity about what not to do, I feel, uh, than what to do, which is important. I think at least to know what not to do is important because, because, because that's what leads to ultimately uh, the idea of what to do, right? Uh, by eliminating a lot of other options. Sure. So I think my journey, I, I certainly feel, uh, was that way. Uh, if I could digress a little bit, there used to be a show called The Charlie Rose Show in the United States on PBS that you may have seen. Charlie would interview a lot of uh, famous people and he would ask them that, you know, when did it become clear that this is what you should work on? Right. Uh, and uh, because after that, the journey is known to people. Sure. Uh, and, and, and how did it come about? Yes. And he said that uh, he was he had never gotten an answer from him, uh, somebody that, you know, I knew exactly uh, or, or this is how it came about. But what happens was that it was there and it got uncovered. Once you removed the bushes, it was there. Interesting. And, and that makes so much sense, right? But, um, you know, and I'll come to this once again, because this is a very important reference point or an anchor point that you've just said in this episode of the Clarity Podcast. Uh, tell me something, you know, what prompted you to, to, to take a PhD, right? Because look, you were there in the land very near to Silicon Valley, you know, the, the, the celebrated land of entrepreneurship in the world, right? So now what inspired you to say, hey, I wouldn't be an entrepreneur, I would really want to be do a PhD and, and change the world like that? Yeah, so that's a very important question. I had an admission to do PhD s several times before I actually took up one. Wow! Because and, and now I tell people that if the problem you want to solve needs you to become an independent thinker, then a PhD is useful. Because the process of PhD is to make you an independent thinker, is to teach you how to identify an important problem, 
how to stand by it and say this indeed in the entire gamut of things is an important problem to solve work on it for five six long years uh, with tenacity to come up with a unique solution that contributes to the knowledge frontier and then stand by your answer and say that this is indeed the one of the best answers we can find for it and also have the humility to say that here are the limitations of these answers i think that journey if one wants to learn regardless of uh, the uh, topic in mind then i think a phd is important and for me once i realize that i want to understand how technology interfaces with the society and therefore how we should incorporate the societal uh, dynamics into the design of technology itself and i realized that i needed some time to study it and a phd was the right way to do it because at the end of it i will have a way to signal also practically to the market that this person actually has tried to do it through a, a structured process during your phd were you more theoretical in nature or were you somebody who actually looked at problems and said okay i will create more solutions around it i'll try and tinker around with things i'll mm. look at creating more things so were you a more practical oriented um, individual who mm. i was uh, applied uh, i was not uh, fully theoretical although the question we i asked in my phd was a uh, uh, quite a theoretical and a fairly ubiquitous question that arises at very diff many levels and is going to bother us for many years to come uh, the question i asked was when new technologies are on the horizon and begin to displace the incumbent technological regime how can a regulator make sure that they balance the need for regulatory compliance that was served by the existing technologies while promoting innovation that is brought by the new technology sure this is we are facing this at all levels at homes uh there's a question of how much to discipline your children versus how much creativity to allow at workplace there's a similar a balance between process versus creation um similarly at policy level there is the same question uh today uh, how much of our existing banking system to be displaced with the digital uh, uh banking uh how much of our telephony uh infrastructure which has served us in uh, being able to call the police being able to support the disabled uh to be displaced with an internet based innovations which don't have that burden or has not had that. so so that is the balance type of a question that i asked and it needed me to study the theories but it also needed me to go out and uh, build models uh, behavioral models of consumers corporations regulators uh, to to answer theoretical questions with modeling tools during the phd right and that was a defining moment in your life um, did you have any such moments of clarity that that after my phd i would take up a corporate job because most people would that that pays your bills right or i would i would go towards policy making i would go towards um, you know where i am actually leading to dr west of uh, is is your decision to come to india right because you've always had that streak inside you even during those long walks that uh, how do how does my life make the society a lot better right so were you more inclined towards a corporate job or were you more inclined towards policy making and and what did you choose i was probably quite impractical uh, uh i was um, um i was always on the supply side of uh, the curve i was not on the demand side of the curve if you would you know sure. uh, and so i was willing to take much less money uh, a trade off money for impact wow um so um in that sense uh, i was willing to take on uh, so so why uh, so I, i decided to go i i decided to stay in academia 
because uh, here's another way to think about it which may be useful to people see there are three dimensions that one can think along one is uh, research which is knowing what to do second is uh, practice or action which is doing what needs to be done and the third is teaching or which is to make sure that the coming generations do what you have done the problem that interests me has interested me for many years and will interest me for many years to come is that can we avoid enduring the inequities that we have come to endure in the material world when it comes to information world because my background is in information systems sure sure so this is the deepest question that interests me of course it is right to have an impact on that you need to do research because you need to know what problems to solve of course you need to take action because to solve those problems or address those problems and you need to be able to teach so that people after you can continue to work on it because this is a at least a 10 20 30 year question it is so and academia was the only platform that had flexibility to do all three uh, a corporate job would be could be a lot of research plus action but generally not teaching pretty much yes. right uh, 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 becoming a teacher would be a lot of teaching plus some research but possibly not action sure so so any combinations that i looked at had two of those three but not all three so so therefore the i i stayed on with the academic uh, platform and um, again as i said from from purely from the perspective of maximizing economic returns it's an impractical thing to do but then what else is there in life <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my next question in fact um, you know one of the one of the important things to understand about a person on the clarity podcast is the person himself right so uh, look in in the world today largely in in the construct of the world right the world is fundamentally running after money everyone's running after money right most people are not mm-hmm. okay. i'm not generalizing for everyone though but you were clear in terms of taking this choice that hey you know what i would still keep my depth of question my value or the legacy that i will build in the world in my lifetime way more ahead than money right you 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 clearly made the decision um if and and you can choose not to answer this question as well you were able to make this decision look a lot of us want to probably and we are not able to for example i want to do that but i am yet not able to um for one simple reason i think for me it's the finances of the family it's 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 very very clear for you what what was it uh you know were you were you well off from a family you know did you come from money or was it just the fact that no i will i will i will just do it because i really want to do this yeah it was the latter um and the brunt of this decision is also perhaps not as much on me as it is on my family i i i appreciate that very deeply um because for me i am engaged in a purpose that matters to me but for them there is neither the purpose nor the money absolutely yeah Wow, and uh, your life has been very interesting, and I per- personally got very fascinated with yourself for for one very important reason. Uh, you know, the moment I met you, I realized that here is a man who who genuinely is in the right job at this point of time. This country, India, Bharat, needs needs you. It's as simple as that. And I'm not saying it just because I'm sitting here in front of you. You know, there's no there's no uh, advantage that I have in, in in saying this, but you know. we really are at a place in the world at a place in time where either we could skyrocket and and really sort of you know be a rocket ship as we call in the startup language right and 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 go big or we could still face the dark ages right i i do understand the narrative that we are you know one of the largest you know and the, and the fastest growing economies in the world and so on so forth look my question now to you is you you have a much larger perspective of the world you've seen the us um and very closely indeed uh, for many many years over a decade in fact you know you uh, have seen india some of the smallest villages you know it, we, we generally in delhi mumbai bangalore we talk about tier 1 2 3 you've gone to tier 4 5 6 right yeah. and today with atal innovation mission you are you're really impacting this country massively right i mean there are 10000 plus 
schools where you 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 established the tinkering labs, utter tinkering labs, right? Um, Seventy five lakh plus students have engaged with uh, your initiative. The, the impact is just massive, right? Today, when you're running this mission as the mission director, how do you see India? at this moment from the from the perspective of of course the Atal innovation mission i appreciate that right mm. and what do you feel like this there would be that breakthrough moment in which dr chintan vaishnav would say boom i've done this this is what i want to do right mm. uh, I, I don't know if you might not have even think thought of that yeah. or, or, or maybe you manifested this thought sometime in your life you, you see this dream when you mm. sleep that chintan you know this will be the moment man when you will just scream out loud and say that chintan you did it oh gosh <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, well, first of all, I think when that moment comes, it will not only be my moment, right? So uh, it'll be the country's moment. At least it will be our team's moment. <laughs> At the very least. So that's that. But what 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 is it that uh, what what is the desirable uh, outcome? I, I think uh, if if I were to put it. Um, in terms that may sound philosophical, but they really not, uh, not not at all are philosophical. Is that I think our moment will be when anything that ought not to be a barrier to innovation is ceases to be a barrier to innovation. That will be our moment. For example, we have started to work in that direction. Language ought not to be a barrier to creativity. Today it is because only those who speak English reasonably comfortably participate in our innovation ecosystem. True. That's only 11% of Indians. When we will eliminate that barrier, we are well on it. I mean, we have started on it in that direction by teaching design thinking in all 22 languages, uh, uh, now Indian languages and so on. But we have a long way to go. But when somebody just like healthcare today, if I'm not well, no matter which country I'm in, if I'm not well, I go to a doctor and I don't care what language they speak. As simple as that. The day when our innovator with a good idea will go to an investor without worrying about what language they speak, I think we would have arrived. Wow. And, and, and that's fascinating, right? And I know for a fact that, that you're on your way. Um, I mean, in, at least you've taken the first step. Uh, you are, by the Atal Innovation Mission, your vernacular um, you know, program, which is what you call the VIP, um, in a country like India where they're language fundamentally changes every few kilometers in many, many ways, yeah. right? I think it will be fascinating when anybody across the country, whether speaking Hindi, Urdu, Malayali, Punjabi, Gujarati, Bengali, whatever, I mean, whatever be the language, yeah. right? Would just pitch their ideas and, and make things happen. Right. It's, would think in their language. Wow. First yes. of all, right? Because I think this is a, this diversity is there to celebrate, not to make barriers out of. Absolutely. And, and, and today it is, you know, because larger part of the internet is English. Yeah. Even today, I do appreciate we have Hindi blogs, we have Hindi websites. Yeah. But but still, very very less. Yeah. It's it's minuscule. Uh, I do know of certain interesting apps you know people have created, uh, but largely with a lot of foreign investment and different yeah. interests yeah, yeah. now in those apps and so on so forth. Yeah. Of course, I but similarly, that. I mean, gender. Why should that have to do any anything to do with creativity? Nothing at all. I don't care. Right. Uh, uh, so, so, so all of these various sort of demarcations that are there ought to completely vanish. Uh, on that note, let me ask you another tough one, right? And which is related to it. So, so this is what you ma you're manifesting. Tell me something. Uh, you know, education is important for all of this to happen. Of course, right? Mm -hmm. Of uh, course. Yeah. I, I do appreciate that creativity. I mean, that moment of clarity can, or a light bulb moment can happen anytime, right? But education is, is base, it's foundation. Yeah. You know, most of our education looks at what I've gone through in this country, mm -hmm. right? Uh, myself, and I've had several years of education. I, I I don't know how useful it is today, but I can tell you that um, it is not much useful, right? At <laughs> least from my perspective, personally, right? What utter Tinkering Labs is doing is that different from the current education system, or is it, it is it the same? Wherein you know what we are taught, we, we just put it down on an exam sheet of paper and we are ranked over it. So so how are you creating that that breakthrough in the minds of people that uh, said so that they are able to come to your labs and create something? Yeah, so utter tinkering labs are in in some ways diametrically opposite. Okay. Uh, there are no exams in utter tinkering labs. Okay. Here's a place where you go and you you can pick a problem. In other words, you look around and you say, oh, here's an interesting problem I want to solve. 
and and then you you are taught techniques to uh, learn to structure your creativity to come up with a solution but this is a place where problem comes first solution comes next whereas in rest of the education solution comes first then you are asked a problem to which you write a solution you, people already know you are already taught the solution so so the tinkering labs are much closer to the real life where problems come before the solution comes also you realize there are several other things happen you realize that there is no single solution to many problems that is true in regular education that's not true often you realize that this is the only place where where where, where we hope it occurs to students for the first time that you are not a consumer of things you can be a maker of things very interesting imagine if for some, so many people it would, it would be life changing if you are told that listen you can't sit on a chair unless you make it we will stop taking chairs for granted right wow. <laughs> similarly <laughs> similarly so so this whole idea of uh, i am not a mere consumer i have capacity to make things then there are all these questions of materials and all of that right so uh, for instance last week we re released a compendium with aiot integration in curriculum with intel and cbsc where we have taken chapters from science and social science textbooks from 6th grade onwards okay. and we've taken concepts in those chapters and produce a stepwise guide to learn the same concept through artificial intelligence tinkering and uh, iot wow. internet of things so now there is an entire parallel compendium to a library where you can go and with your hand start learning these concepts and the inquiry is totally different now right and 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 the moment i mean right now having this conversation with you i am having these goosebumps i'll be why because the moment you capture that on camera in in a certain way if you're able to record that one person creating something and the other person could sort of just take it to a completely different level it's infinite yeah wow yeah and this is going to happen this is going to happen we have now published it as a stepwise formula so people can get started Sorry, I'm just being curious because you know, for me, uh, this is this is a moment of clarity for me personally. By the way, in this session right now, mm. uh, so so somebody goes to your lab, the Atul Tinkering Lab. Mm. They enter in as a student. Yeah. Right? They have gone through possibly a similar uh, education system that I've gone through, right? Yeah. Wherein they're not taught to create at all. In fact, that's why sadly we are being uh, you know called as largest consumer market uh, yeah. rather than really a creator market. So somebody walks into the lab. Yeah. And do they get tools? Do they what, what do they get? Yeah, so they get 3D printers, mechanical desk, electronic desk. They we also have created an annual curriculum uh, or, or, or sort of a timetable for teachers, we've trained teachers to teach how to use these tools and so on. But then that's really only the base layer, right? Okay. To solve problems with that capability is uh, the the world is unlimited. And do you also get mentors or interesting experts from outside who could just sort of come in and open the vision, the worldview a lot more? Absolutely, we have we have connected more than five thousand mentors now from private sector, government, academia, who want to give back and want to uh, get in touch with schools or children. And bring their worldview to these people. Coming to the third and last part of this podcast, uh, Dr. Vaishnav, um, you know, for me, this has been one of the finest conversations, and I'm not kidding you. Now, we are coming to the present, right? 2022, the month is September, the date is 20th today. You've seen quite a world, you've seen quite a lot of things shaping up in the US, right? You've seen quite a lot of things shaping up in India. I'll ask you two questions. Number one, what are the most exciting opportunities of the future that now excites you? You know, something that you say, wow, man, I could never imagine this, but but now I want uh, you to be part of it, let's say, right? That's one. It could be technology, it could be sociology, it could be anything, right? Any, it could be small changes as well. And the second part of the question is, how are you now shaping the future with all the resources, it, you know, everything that is at your disposal? How are you now shaping the future? Okay, so there are two questions here. That what's the big thing that excites me and given everything that's at my uh, that at my disposal what can we do about it so i think one challenge where there isn't i mean this may sound a bit cliched but where there isn't enough understanding or thrust but it is an unavoidable challenge to work on 
it is also the most exciting and perhaps the greatest opportunity but again largely not taken seriously by our youth at least in india and that's the challenge of climate change so here i think if we don't do anything we're dead <laughs> as simple as that right so we have to do something about it it is most exciting for our country most challenging also because we are imagining a very high growth for the next 10 20 30 years sure but we have to deliver it with a very little carbon budget mm-hmm. this is not a challenge anybody else in the world has had so we cannot look to anybody for solutions here this is something we have is for us to solve but when we will solve it it will be useful to rest of the world guaranteed because this is a global problem so either we solve it and then take it to the world and make the best of it or somebody else comes here and solves it for us i think we should choose the former so that's that's the piece that uh, although i'm not an expert in it but as a systems person as i look at it i realize how colossal a problem this is that we will have to work on and and it's urgent also right it's urgent because a lot of the damage from climate change has already happened in the western and the central parts of india and what can we do about it the place where we really see the impact of climate change in our nation is the northeast at this moment is it this is a microcosm from which the entire world can learn the impact of climate change because it is uh, it is far more visible there than in many other parts of the world wow i don't know about this we should do everything we can to prevent it throw every innovation that we can at it and we should teach the entire world how to deal with it i think that's where i'd like to put a lot of resources so we can not only protect ourselves but also turn it into something an opportunity where we solve the global problems india as a nation one more time fantastic and fascinating on that note dr chintan vaishnav it was absolute pleasure and a sincere honor having you on the clarity podcast thank you so much for for not just sharing your life your moments of clarity but also spreading clarity for the future generations i don't know after we both are gone uh, i shouldn't be saying this but i don't know who who all will listen to this podcast and they'll gain so much more from your experiences sir lots of blessings to you i wish you infinite energy and may you get so much more in life that you are able to impact the world with your depth your meaning and your life sir thank you so much for the video thank you very much paritosh and thanks for doing this for the world